All right. All right, I'm looking for a light. Has anybody seen a light back here? You guys see a light? I'm looking for a light, and it's supposed to lead me to these kids. Anybody? Anybody seeing a light? Where is it at? No, I'm not seeing a light up there. Where is it? Where are these kids? I'm trying to figure out where this light's going to come from. Have you seen this? Oh, okay. Wait a second. Is there a light over there? All right. There it is. Oh, here's the kids. It's good to see you guys. How you guys doing? Good. You know who else followed a light? Who else followed the light? Well, Jesus was the light, but who followed? The three wise men. That's right. <laughs> and, and what did they do when they, when they were looking for the light? What did they do with that light? They followed it, and where did it lead them to? Uh, That's right, where Jesus was born. And what did they do when they got there? That's right, they gave him gifts, and they bowed down, and they worshiped him, right? And, you know, somebody already answered this question, but who else called themselves the light? That's right, Jesus did call them. He called himself light. He said, I am the light. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. You know that? <laughs> And you know, I spent, before I followed Jesus, I knew who Jesus was, but I never really followed him. I always thought that other things would make me happy, like putting myself first, and like, we're going to be getting toys. Did some of you guys already get toys? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, you got some toys too, right? And I always thought that that would be what would make me happy, or, or having friends, or being like, that's what I thought would bring me out of darkness. But Jesus says, he's the way out of darkness. And, uh, you know, Jesus' ways are always different. Because so we always think that if we put ourselves first, we'll get what we want, right? No. Yeah, you, you do. Don't lie, Troy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, God, God's ways are always different, right? And like a king is normally born in a palace, where was Jesus born at? So it always looks different than what we think, but that's what Jesus calls us to do. He calls us to follow him. And it's another one to, you know, like the wise men followed the light, right? A lot of people might have seen that light, and Herod even knew that a king was born, but that doesn't mean he followed it. So it's one thing to know that, that Jesus is light, but it's another thing to follow him. And it's important to follow his ways. How do we, how do we follow Jesus? Yeah, but, well, yeah, kind of. By obeying him, that's right. He says that if you, if you love me, you'll do what I say. What are some of the other ways that we follow him? Yeah. Go to church, we learn more about him. So we need to know who Jesus is in order to follow him. And he gives us his word. And do you know what happens as you follow Jesus, as you read your Bible, as you go to church, and as you listen to him and obey what he says, what happens? Go to heaven and what... We become believers. We become the wise men, right? We become wise like the wise men that follow Jesus and worship him. So the more time you spend with Jesus, you know, he says he's the light of the world, but what happens when you, when you follow Jesus? Yeah. You become the light of the world. That's exactly right. And so I got an illustration here for you guys. Okay, I'm, I'm wearing a bracelet. So, like, this flashlight is light, right? And it produces light. But this glow-in-the-dark bracelet doesn't produce any light for itself. But as it spends time with the light, the light gets trapped inside of it. And what happens to the glow-in-the-dark bracelet? It glows by itself, right? It starts to glow because it's got the light of, of the flashlight inside of it. Just like when you spend time with Jesus, the light gets inside of you and people start to see that light and you glow just like Jesus glowed. Isn't that cool? Yeah? So it's good to spend time with Jesus. So I have a practical application for you guys. You guys read the Bible at home? Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah, we do. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Troy. You make us look good, you know? <laughs> I, I want to give you guys a practical application. If you guys don't read the Bible every day, I want you to make sure you ask your mommy and daddy to read the Bible to you every night before you go to bed. Okay? Say, mommy and daddy, I want to go to bed, but can we read the Bible first? And then as you start to learn about Jesus, you start to follow more. Does that sound good? 
First John is a good place to start if you want to learn all about the light and walking in it, all right? All right, so who wants to light a candle here? <laughs> all right. Who did not light a candle the last two years? Be honest, we just talked about walking in the light. <laughs> you didn't light one yet? All right. Okay, we got one candle light, just one candle light today. Let's go back out. Who knows where the uh, lighter is? Dear God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for this day that we get to celebrate your birth. Lord, we ask that you would, you would uh, just fill our hearts with awe and wonder for you today. Help us not to, to just think about toys and think about what we want all the time, but help us to follow you in everything that we do and to seek after you and to spend time with you. And God, we thank you for how good you are to us, how merciful you are. And we know, God, we don't produce any light on our own. So, Lord, help us to seek after your presence and, and to, to glow with your light and to point people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we got some of these glow bracelets and flashlights, courtesy of Bible League International. And uh, <laughs> we're going to hand these out to you, okay? So come come on. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And we'll turn now to the last part of Luke's Gospel that we'll read in our Advent and Christmas series through the infancy narrative from Luke about Jesus. We'll read from Luke 2, verses 21 to 38. Luke 2, verses 21 to 38. Before we read, let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would fill us with the truth which it speaks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting in verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was eighty-four. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Sometimes 
Sometimes the Bible is full of very obvious points. You read through the story of Abraham, and if you're paying attention at all, you see the the main point of the story of Abraham is faith. You read through the story of the Ten Commandments, and the main theme is that God is holy and has requirements for His people. You read the book of Job, and it's about suffering. You read Proverbs, it's about wisdom. There are these big overarching main themes, but sometimes there are there are little subtler themes that wind their way through the Scriptures. And if we go back through the portion of Luke's Gospel which we've looked at, we see that one of these themes has to do with the theme of darkness and light. We began our time with the shepherds. And what were the shepherds? They were doing ordinary shepherding things. And where were they? They were out in the fields. And when were they? It was night. It was dark. But suddenly, out of the darkness comes this incredible light, this, this terrifying light. Light. The shepherds are enveloped by the glory of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord is there and speaks the good news. And what does he speak out of this light? But he says that the child has been born, who is the Savior, who is Christ, who is the Lord Himself. And the lesson here, which is subtle in the text, is that the world has been laying under darkness, that darkness was once again over the face of the earth. But now, in the coming of the Christ, light has begun to scatter and even to shatter the darkness in the coming of the Lord who is light. And so today we have opportunity to focus on three piercings, the first of which is the piercing of the light into the darkness. And we'll start there in verses 21 to 24. On the eighth day, When it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons." Luke pays particular attention to the holiness of Jesus' parents, to the obedience of Jesus' parents. They go on the eighth day, precisely as the law of the Lord commanded to the temple to have their son circumcised, and then they give him the name Jesus, the exact and precise name which the angel had told them they were to give him. And they go as well to present two sacrifices, these two sacrifices again in obedience to the law of God. And the firstborn is to receive an extra sacrifice. And this sacrifice is taught about in Exodus 13 verse 2 and Numbers 18 verse 15. And the reason for this extra sacrifice goes all the way back, if you can remember with me, all the way back to the Exodus. When the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt and they cried out to the Lord for deliverance, the Lord sent a a series of plagues, the greatest of which, the last of which, was the plague of death. And the angel of the Lord goes through the whole land of Egypt and he slays the firstborn child in every home. Firstborn son. With the exception of the homes who had the blood of a lamb painted over the doorpost. And what does the blood of the lamb signify? It signifies that every house was worthy of God's judgment. The only difference between the houses that had their firstborn sons killed and those that didn't was grace, was a sacrifice. And so, From that point on, every firstborn son was to be consecrated to the Lord because the people remember that their sons were also worthy of death, but they were saved by God's grace. So every firstborn is consecrated with a sacrifice. And so Jesus' parents bring him forward for the sacrifice of redemption. Of course, we no longer make this sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus is the sacrifice of redemption, putting an end to all other sacrifices. But then there's another sacrifice spoken of in Leviticus 12, 16 to 13, which is a sin offering. A sin offering made by a mother after giving birth. And that might seem like a very strange thing. After all, isn't it the very first thing commanded in the Bible is be fruitful and multiply? So why would, why would someone who's just given birth, why would there need to be a sacrifice on the occasion of, 
a birth. Well, it's a good reminder for us that even infants are in need of the saving grace of the Lord. And so when a child is born out of a, a recognition of the sinfulness in our own hearts, even from our conception forward, a sacrifice is offered. And we might remember from beginning to end we are in need of the grace of God. And so Mary and Joseph offer this sacrifice. Typically it's to be a lamb, but if a lamb is not affordable for a family, then they could offer, according to the Lord's provision, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Jesus, being the son of Joseph of common stock, if not in poverty, at least not wealthy, his parents offer the lesser of the two options. They offer the pair of doves or two young pigeons. And in this, we see the beginning of light in the darkness. The world that Jesus comes into is a very dark world. But even in that darkness of that world, his parents are righteous. And he comes as a righteous child born to righteous parents. And then we see more about this piercing of the darkness as we move into verses 25 to 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now the Bible is, is so rich. You have so many different kinds of characters. You have the main character who is Jesus. All the scripture is about Jesus. And you have other, other main characters on just a, a rung below that, so to speak. Abraham and Noah and Adam and David and Jesus and Peter and Paul. And you have characters maybe a step below that. Solomon and perhaps some of the prophets. Job, uh, etc. But then you, you have very, very minor characters like maybe Melchizedek in the Old Testament, or here we have Simeon and Anna. Minor characters, the Scripture just covers an hour or two or three of their lives and then disappear, but they leave an enduring impact upon the people of God. And Simeon is, is one of those characters. I think we should particularly enjoy Simeon and what he, what he does in the life of Jesus. And the Scripture describes him in verse 25, in very flattering terms, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. Now wouldn't you like it if the Lord were to describe you that way? If someone inspired by the Holy Spirit was to say of you that you were righteous and devout, that would be very, very high praise. A comforting thing to hear about yourself. But we ought not to get too far carried away with Simeon's own righteousness because you see very quickly that Simeon is declared righteous, but the, the Lord's Spirit is in him. Three times in verses 25, 26, and 27, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in, in accordance with him or in relationship to him. The first thing is the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. Then it says the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would see the Christ before he died. And the third thing is the Holy Spirit moves Simeon. Simeon is a great man only because he is filled and blessed by a great God. And Simeon receives this special revelation, and it is incredibly special. He is told that he will not die until he sees the consolation of Israel. He will not die until he has seen with his eyes the Savior himself. And so he, he moves into the temple by the prompting of the Holy Spirit to go and see the fulfillment of this promise. Now, I want to take just a, a brief aside and try to offer a little bit of clarity on circumstances like this. Because we need to understand that Simeon's experience is unique. The, the Lord does not speak to us regularly or to anybody regularly in this way, we need to understand the difference between descriptive scriptures and 
prescriptive scriptures. I'll start with the first, descriptive. Descriptive scriptures describe something that happened. But it doesn't describe something that will always happen. For instance, the story of David and Goliath. Right? It's a descriptive story. We might, learn, we might learn a lesson from the story. The lesson could be that God takes very, very uh, unusual people like shepherd boys who are the youngest or carpenter's sons and can make them and does make them into great heroes and kings. That, that's the lesson, but it's not describing what we should do. The lesson is not that you should all go take smooth stones, put them in a sling, and kill the local tall person you don't like. That's not the, the lesson of the story. Praise God. So that's descriptive, things that happen, but then there are prescriptive things we ought to do. Think of a doctor who prescribes you medication. And so these are things that we ought to do. Jesus says that you should love your neighbor as yourself. He says that you should love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul's letters are are chock full of things that we should or shouldn't do. Those are our prescriptions, and and one of the keys to being a good Bible reader is being able to determine the difference between things that are described and things that are prescribed. And being able to discern those things will help us greatly, and this is an instance of that, an instance of, of Simeon. Simeon has a unique descriptive happenstance. The Lord tells him specifically that he will see the Lord's Christ before he dies. That is not normal for people. If you came to me and you said, you know, the Lord has told me that I will not die before Jesus comes back. And I I know when this is going to happen. I remember about 10 years ago, driving down the road, you see all these billboards. The Lord is going to return. I forget the day. Maybe it was like October 22 of of 2000 and uh, what would it be? Maybe 2010, something like that. And Oh, the world was all a tizzy because this, this very famous guy who got really rich off of his his crackpot predictions, was saying the world was going to end. Of course it didn't. If you came to me and said, I, the Lord has told me when the world is going to end, I would try to very politely, but probably not very successfully, tell you that I didn't believe you at all. Why? Because the Lord says that He's going to come like a thief in the night. It is not normal for people to receive this kind of specific revelation. I remember when, when I was younger, I hope this doesn't happen anymore, when I was younger, it was, it was in vogue for a time for young men who liked young women, who would never like them back, to try to say something like this, the Lord has told me that I'm supposed to marry you. What a wretched thing to do. And the right response for her should have been, that's funny, he didn't tell me that. And if some young man came and said, the Lord has specifically revealed to me that one of your daughters is supposed to marry me, I would say he has specifically revealed to me that that is not true and that you should remove yourself from my presence before I do it for you. This is, this is not normal. We don't, re, we don't normally receive these kinds of revelations. And, and lately, something has been in the news about this where, where we, we think that we are more unique than perhaps we really are. There was this, this great tragedy, a, a doubly sad tragedy. There was a, a two-year-old daughter of, of worship leaders at a very famous church who died. This is a, a great tragedy in its own right. But the the greater of the tragedies, or the second tragedy perhaps, is how the church grieved, or rather didn't grieve. Instead of preaching the hope of the resurrection like Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians 15, instead they decided they were going to declare that this child would live, not not when Christ returns, but here and now. They they said things like this, We call on the mighty, all-sufficient name of Jesus, And we call you back by name, sweet girl. You will live. And and as as kind of a background, as an authority for this, they said, well, it's happened before. We have biblical precedent. Elijah raised the dead. Elisha raised the dead. Jesus raised the dead. Peter and Paul raised the dead. We, We have this. Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And he came out. But the problem is, you're not Jesus. We don't get to decide when someone is raised from the dead or not. We aren't prophets. We certainly aren't the Son of God. And we aren't apostles. Those things all point us forward to the time when God raises the dead in His own time. And so we see here that Simeon is unique and uniquely blessed. And he is uniquely blessed. He has this 
revelation from God Himself that He will not die before He has seen the Lord's Christ the one who had been promised already to Eve in the garden. He would see this one. And so moved by the Holy Spirit, he comes into the temple and he sees Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, and how he knows precisely we aren't told, but he knows that the child in their arms is the one that has been promised. And so he goes and he scoops up this child. And you've got to be thinking what his parent, what Jesus' parents are thinking. Who is this guy and why has he grabbed my child? Some of you germaphobic mothers are extra cringing right now. I don't want a stranger touching my kids. And so he goes and he scoops up this child, but then he has this incredible prophecy. It's an incredible prophecy in this song. And he he says part of it has to do with darkness and light. That this child would be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. These Gentile nations had walked in darkness at least from the time of Noah. And they had walked in darkness, as Paul says, without hope and without God in the world. And all these other nations had perished apart from God. But that's all about to change. And now the light, which was largely restricted to Abraham and his offspring, now is going to spread to the very ends of the earth. There's a Latin saying, post tenebrix lux, after darkness, light. And that was the experience of the Gentiles, of which I suspect all of us, or nearly all of us, are numbered where before our ancestors walked in darkness, now by God's grace we walk in light, in the light of God. And why? Why is the darkness pierced for us? And why do we walk in light? Because of this child. Because of this child, the darkness which would otherwise have dominated our lives has given way to the piercing of light. But the darkness is not the only thing to be pierced. The prophet says as well, Simeon says as well, that Mary will be pierced, her soul will be pierced. We read that in verses 33 to 35. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. You have to imagine this stopped Mary in her tracks. Everything has been good news before this. The angels had good news. The shepherds revealed that good news, relayed that good news to Mary and Joseph. They, they come into the temple to do all of their, their due diligence to keep the law. And, and while they're there, this, this Simeon, this old righteous man, has this good news. I mean, their son is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to the people of Israel. This is all good news. And then suddenly, boom, this drops like a thud. This child, will be spoken against. This child will be a sign who is rejected. This child will reveal thoughts. This child will cause falling and rising. This child will be the cause of your own soul being pierced. With all this light, it certainly seems as though this news would cast a shadow on Mary's heart. And you just wonder, don't you? You just wonder for the rest of her life what she did with this. Wouldn't you have always been waiting for the other shoe to drop? When does the piercing come? And it was true what the prophet said, what Simeon said was true. Her soul would be pierced in time. Jesus would cause the rising and the falling of many. And hearts would be revealed. Thoughts would be revealed. Jesus himself would say, you're either for me or you're against me. And it would be shown in time who was for him and who was against him. And and prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners would rise because of him, and the self-righteous would fall because of him. And he was spoken against, and he was the one who, who, was, who was destroyed even, who was crucified as the Scripture tells us. John speaks of a similar thing to what Simeon said in John 1, 11 and 12. He, that is Jesus, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Some did receive him, but even more did not. He was the sign spoken against. But then that last thing, that last thing in this prophecy to Mary must have been most chilling. A sword will pierce your own soul. This is a, a broad sword. It's not a narrow sword. It's not like a pin. It's the kind of sword where if it went into you, it caused drastic damage. And he says, this will pierce your own soul. And this would happen because her little boy would become a man. And he would have an incredible ministry, healing the sick and feeding the hungry and walking on water and calming seas, teaching with, with wisdom and authority and putting to shame those who fancied themselves to be wise and, and preaching good news to the poor, as Luke will later say. He, he reveals God to people. He even raises the dead. But then he's arrested. Tried in a fake trial. Flogged to the point where he's not recognizable anymore. They, they make him carry a cross until he can't carry it any longer. They, they pierce his hands and his feet and they nail him to that cross. They hang him naked for everybody who walks by to see and to scoff and, and to, to shame. He's the object of ridicule. And then on top of that, here's where the, the soul of Mary is pierced. She has to watch as her son heaves for breath naked upon a Roman cross. She watches his blood pouring from his beaten body and his pierced hands and feet pool at the bottom of this cross. She hears the soldiers and the passers-by jeering at her son. And she must have thought in that moment, that a sword going through her heart would have hurt less than the sword going through her soul. She hears her son as he's crushed under the weight of the sin of his people. And he's crushed under the wrath of God. She hears her own son crying out about his forsakenness. My God, my God, the words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's all good news. But there will be plenty of bad news to come for Mary. But as we see, in God's perfect providence, it was perfectly bad news. Because he would be the redeemer. And the prophetess Anna takes this upon her lips as we look at verses 36 to 38. There was also a prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. Another way to read that is that she was widowed 84 years after she had lived with her husband. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. The name Anna is is a Greek form of the Hebrew name Hannah, which means grace. Ironic in our case, we guess you could say in our family we have two graces. But she speaks of God's grace. She speaks of the redemption of God. That God will save His people out of their sins. And there's a, another subtle point here. So far in just these first two chapters, who, who has spoken about this child? But first, Angels spoke of this child. And then men spoke of this child. Now a woman speaks of this child. And it's as if the Lord is saying, all of my self-conscious creatures, all of my creatures with a conscience, all of my creatures whom I have created to have a relationship with me, all of them testify to the greatness of my Son. All of creation sings His praise, especially those whom He has given a mind to. And intelligence. And like, like Simeon, Anna is particularly righteous. The scripture says of her here, she never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. She never left the temple. Now that, that is almost certainly hyperbole or, or literary exaggeration. It doesn't mean that she actually physically never left the, the temple. 
It's like if a, a kid says to you, you never let me have any fun. Right? It's not that you never let a child have any fun. It just means that generally you're kind of a spoil sport. Or if someone, if someone says, you know, you know I, I live at church. Now some of you are great gifts, right? You're great gifts. You, you serve in church all the time. It, it's a great blessing to a church. But you don't actually live here, right? That would be very strange. But we get the idea when someone, when someone uses this kind of language, we understand that it means that they, that they serve often. And so here we get, the, we get the sense very plainly about Anna that she is extremely righteous and she is very devoted to God. Her whole life is defined by devotion to God, fasting and praying in the temple all the time. And those of you who are older, and those of us who by God's grace and in God's providence will one day ourselves be older ought to take note that our waning days shouldn't be spent getting agitated in front of cable news networks or doing crossword puzzles or reading cheesy Christian romance novels or whatever else it is, or, or as John Piper says, collecting seashells on the shore. Our waning days ought to be spent, as the rest of our days ought to be spent, in God's service. God gives us years and months and days and hours that we might use them for His glory, not fritter them away. And so this old woman is in, the, is in the temple and she sees the child in Simeon's arms and then she goes about to anybody who will listen to her telling them about this child. And you've got to wonder what those people who heard about this child from her were thinking. Who is this, who is this kind of uh, eccentric old lady and why is she so excited about this baby? Why not the other ones? What does she speak about him? She says that this child is the Redeemer. He is the one who will save God's people. Specifically, he is the Redeemer of Jerusalem. That is, that he will, he will build back up the kingdom of God, which seemed at the moment to have disappeared from the face of the earth. And here we go back to where we started, with the darkness being pierced. For thousands of years, the people of God had waited for this moment. They had waited for this child. They had waited for the one who would restore the people of God. They had waited for the one who would restore perfection to the earth. And this prophetess, this old holy lady, says that finally the child that they had waited for has now arrived. But our world is still a dark place, isn't it? I was just reading an article this last week about an event which took place in the early part of the last century during World War I. The event is the Armenian Genocide, something that most of us don't know a whole lot about. And that was intentional. It was committed during World War I because the whole, the whole earth was consumed with other events going on. But the Ar Armenian Genocide took place in modern-day Turkey, not because there's turkeys there, because it was founded or conquered by Turks, Ottoman Turks, a primarily heavily Muslim country. But in the early part of the 20th century, there was a huge Christian population in the land, primarily ethnic Armenians and Assyrians. But in the genocide, 1.8 million people were slaughtered. One and a half million of them Armenians, 300,000 of them ethnic Assyrians, almost all of them Christians. They were crucified. They were violated. They were slaughtered. If a child was lucky, he would be orphaned. But most were just killed. And we hear, we hear endlessly of the Nazi Holocaust, and rightfully so, lest anything be continued. But we hear almost nothing of this genocide, probably because it was largely committed against Christians. The nation of Turkey still denies that it ever happened even though there's photos and eyewitness accounts more than enough to prove that it did happen. Our world is still a dark place. Genocides, wars that kill millions, weapons of mass destruction, the slaughter of the unborn in our own country, Western civilization racing to its own demise and confusions of gender categories and everything else. Believers being slaughtered in North Africa and West Africa, largely forgotten because they're Christians and they're Africans. The world cares very little for either. The registration of Christians in China for the purpose of being trapped in 
persecuted, churches defecting to theological liberalism, and of course there is perhaps what should most concern us, the disgusting sins in our own hearts. The world is still a very dark place. But praise God that in Christ he has overcome the world. And praise God that in Christ, light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. His birth pierced the darkness. It's like the first ray of the dawn that pierces across the sky and gives hope that the night will be end and the day will come. And in the piercing of his hands and in his feet and the piercing of his side and the piercing of his own mother's soul, in all of that, He gives hope. Because the darkness that overwhelmed his soul means that ours can live in light forever. And because of him, one day there will be no more darkness. We read that in Revelation 22, verse 5. And night will be no more. They will need no lamp of light or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. No darkness. No need of lamps. No need of funeral homes, or doctors, or presumably preachers. Because God is their light, and Christ is with them. Because his kingdom has come, and his is the kingdom of light. As he says of himself in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He suffered darkness, and with it, he pierces the darkness. And he calls us, still today, he calls us to come out of the darkness out of the darkness of sin and death, and to come into the light, to come to him, and to come to the light of eternal life, which shines forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need the light. And we are thankful that you, who are the light of the world, have given yourself to us that we may no longer walk in darkness, but walk in the light. And we who are Gentiles, whose ancestors worship the gods of trees and rocks and hills and valleys, that now by your grace we worship you, the one true God. There is no other. And we give you thanks that one day we live with Christ in the kingdom of light, a kingdom of which there is no end. We pray, giving you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.